So now we're looking at a late 18th century scholar's studio um, that was brought to the museum from the area around Suzhou. And the scholar's studio is a space um, that um, was an, an incredibly important space for upper class men. It's not a space that women are forbidden to enter, although I think a woman would probably go to a studio only upon invitation. What scholars did in their studio is they read, they wrote, they studied, they painted. The upper class in China is really quite different than the upper class in other societies in the 18th and 19th century. Um, the most important upper class is actually not an aristocracy of blood and birth. It is um, a bureaucracy that is recruited through the civil service examination system. And I think it's possible to exaggerate how important social mobility was because studying is very expensive. You had a better chance of spending a lot of time studying if you came from a wealthy family. But it is true if no one in a generation passed the civil service examination, the family status would be in trouble. And one of the things that happens in the novel Dream of the Red Chamber is Bao Yu is simply not interested in studying the, the Confucian classics. Um, and so the family gets in trouble. Uh, one of the objects that the museum holds that is, I think, extremely interesting and is very directly related to this problem is a handkerchief on which are inscribed 10,000 characters which um, have passages from and I think also commentaries on the Analects of Confucius. Um, this is a civil service examination cheat sheet and it is by no means the only one still in existence. Civil service examiners were very concerned about the possibility of cheating on exams to the point that um, when people went into the examination and examinations were held in little tiny cells, you would be searched going into the examination. You would be searched for books, you would be searched for notes, I think you'd probably be searched for cheat sheets, and you were searched for money because there was a fear you would bribe the examiners. Um, and so this is a, this is a kind of a constant, um, a constant pressure. There are several uh, famous examination scandals. Um, the integrity of the system was extremely important. Um, Actually, the examination papers would be rewritten so the examiners could not recognize the handwriting of the candidates. So when the papers were graded, it was done anonymously. I think the cheat sheet suggests the degree to which um, there is a problem with the corruption of the system. And although in Dream of the Red Chamber, Bao Yu never says, I'm not going to participate because the system is corrupt, as is evidenced by cheat sheets. I think <laughs> it does show the degree, um, the degree to which there is kind of an ordinary, an ordinariness to the corruption. In addition to handkerchiefs, there are vests that have on the inside <laughs> um, texts written, so you could just open up your vest wow. and and read things. One of the things that I particularly like about the cheat sheet at the MIA is that it has, it is worn. It is very clearly been used. Um, it, it, it has participated in the participation of a, of a crime. And think about also, in addition to the, what it signals about corruption, think about it also what it says about the anxiety and the importance right. of passing these exams. I mean, 
those characters, think about actually producing that cheat sheet. Well, that takes incredibly painful, I mean, they were tiny, tiny characters. And, and, and just to even write that down was painful and time consuming. So think about the effort it went that took well, to cheat. To cheat, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I think with a lot of such efforts that might have been easier just to do the work, right. but yeah, it, it, it's. Well, and we should say that part of the reason you're doing the cheat sheet I mean, it's it's not. I mean, it, it of course is a memory aid in a system where you are required to have whole text memorized. I mean, the classics. It's not just that you had to know about them. Right. You literally had to memorize them verbatim. So this is a, an incredibly difficult right system. And the desperation. I mean, yeah. I, I, right. I, I sense a lot with the cheat sheets, yeah. and uh, you know, these are. There's so much pressure, and again, right. that, that is not something that has really gone away in, in right. much yeah. of Asia even today. So I, I think that pushes people to do things. And as Anne said, do. Bao Yu is, is at least I'm saying I'm having none of it. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm escaping to the world of the garden and the women's world. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that especially during the earlier periods of Chinese history, one can make an argument that the examination system did a lot of positive things. I mean, for one thing, choosing your leaders among smart, well-educated people does actually have something to say for it. Um, it's also, I think, um, when you think about the, ru the ruling class all read the same books growing up. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean they don't mm -hmm. disagree with one another, but there is kind of a shared vision. Um, but what has happened, I think, by the very late 18th and 19th century is there is a growing criticism that what the examination system has done is it's kind of stultified intellectual life. Um, you spend way more of your time memorizing texts than you do thinking about the world. And the other thing that's happening in the 19th century is the population has exploded and the right. number of, of spots of successful examination candidates right. has not. So, so you get a sense that the system isn't working as right. well as it had been and it's harder to get a place in the system. But if you go back to the scholar studio, so there you have the pressures are on to the, where you go to this point of, of desperation and you're creating this little cheat sheet, then you have to think about what else is in that room. I mean, it's, a, it's supposed to be, by and large, a place where lettered men, educated men, are going to escape to, right? Um, the particular uh, scholar studio we have here at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts is a two-story structure, mm -hmm. which has the, the studio um, looking out on a, on a garden and then uh, previously attached to a house, and then upstairs a place where um, books would be stored, or, or scrolls, or any of the accoutrements, or, or stuff of the scholars would be stored upstairs. Uh, so if you look carefully, you'll see the, the two different parts to it. But uh, again, this is a, a mid to late Qing construction, yep. mm -hmm. and um, you know, a lot of wood, stone floor, you've got a nice little day bed in case you've been reading too much, and, of the Confucian Analects and you've been put to sleep by it, or maybe you just need to rest while you've been practicing your calligraphy. But then you have your, your table where you would be doing your calligraphy, do perhaps getting together with friends to do some calligraphy together, drink a little, do some poetry compositions. On the one side, you'd have a cabinet which uh, is designed to keep cats out to right. peeve the cats, we can talk about that in a second, which does have uh, objects in it, um, far enough away so the cat can't get its paw in. Uh, and then on the other side you have uh, a shelving unit with a number of sort of precious objects. One of the things that the scholars are up to at this time is um, also sort of displaying, kind of like the women have the cosmetic case, which is their, their mm -hmm. thing. The scholar's studio is their world where they're gonna show off their love of antiquities, mm -hmm their love of books, right. their love of scrolls, and their love of sort of um, nature in sort of all its exotic forms. Mm -hmm. So you'll see root sculptures and mm -hmm. brush pots and things made out of unusual pieces of wood, um, nice pieces of ceramics, uh, old you know, bronzes, maybe not so old bronzes, replicas of older bronzes. Um, so all of this shows up along with um, paintings and calligraphy and, and unusual rocks 
that are hanging or situated in this space. So it's a it's sort of a transitional space. It's not of the house. It is attached mm -hmm. to the house, but it's also yeah. attached to the garden. It's this in-between space. Well, and 17th century texts, there's one I'm thinking of where a man is giving instructions to his sons who are young adults, probably in their 20s, and they're married, but they are studying for the civil service exams. And he gives them a daily routine and a weekly routine. And what he says is that they have to, he, he gives them their assignments, how many essays they have to write, how many passages from the analects they have to have memorized every week. And he says, and you will sleep in the study six nights, and you get to sleep with your wife in your own bedroom once a week. Um, so taking that study seriously, we've been talking about you know, that intense pressure. But on the other hand, as you narrated, the sort of antiquities and, and artworks and there are other cultural practices that made up the educated gentleman that you were, you were supposed to cultivate the self, right? That it's not just you know memorizing books and learning to write essays, but you had to have a beautiful calligraphic hand. You actually were graded on your calligraphy in the imperial examination system. And then you were supposed to, in Confucian terms, regulate your emotions through art forms. Um, you were expressing your knowledge and refinement through your collecting of old bronze vessels or ceramics or whatever it might be. So these are all practices that are sort of the fun side of, of what, how a scholar was supposed to cultivate himself. And, and the, this seems to be the part that Bao Yu might Mm -hmm. finds appealing. Right, find appealing. It's just yeah. he doesn't like <laughs> he doesn't like the work side of it uh, so much. Well, well I, memorization. Yeah, right. I mean, I, you know, I would call this an aspect of self-fashioning. The gentleman in the studio would have called it self-cultivation, right. and there is a there is a lot right. of there is a lot of discussion about making the proper self and the right. ways in which. Um, it's important in terms of you, you can't govern others if you can't govern yourself. Mm -hmm. There's um. some fascinating, so in the, the scholar studio here at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, there's the dream stones as we like mm -hmm. to, to refer to them again. These are stones that have been cut and again, we, we see a big rock, you look at it from the outside, you don't know what's happening inside, but Historically, in China, they could read the exterior of the stone, and they would they would cut it in such a way as to to show generally a mountain landscape. Mm -hmm. Right, and right. Um, there's a couple of exceptional examples here in the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. But stones in general, and the whole notion of stones and self-fashioning, you're going to choose which stones you're going to have on your tables, mm -hmm. which what, what images you're going to hang mm -hmm. on your walls. Right, all of that. I mean, one of the things that I really like about those stones is they exist at a juncture between art and nature. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are found right. in nature through highly skilled artisanal practice. And I think that happens a lot, actually. And the With, Scholar Studio yeah. is, is fabulous for that. So again, if you think about those roots and, and, and the, the bamboo and mm -hmm. the furniture, all of these things, it's this, it's it's man sort of manipulating nature. Right, right, right. Um, and sort of freeing, you're trying to free right. that inner essence of that right. know, nature mm -hmm. out, of the, out of the stone, out of the bamboo, out of the, the root. Exactly. Um, and out of the rock. Exactly. Yeah. Well, the whole idea not just behind the Grand View Garden and Dream of the Red Chamber, but behind Chinese gardens in general, is to create a perfect nature. Right, yep. right, exactly. It's very manipulated, manipulated views. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, if you think about the, even the small scholar studio here, and you, you look at it through it, and you have the lattice that then frames your view of the, the little garden outside. Mm -hmm. Again, that, that's a, a miniature version of a mar much larger right. garden scene that you could encounter at any point mm -hmm. in, in China and Qing yeah. Dynasty. And studios China. were always connected to gardens. Yep. Always. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the interesting things about what is on display in the Scholar Studio here at the Minneapolis Institute um, both within the scholar studio and in adjacent cases uh, demonstrates, again, the point that you guys were both making about this manipulation of nature, that there, there is a, 
um, a cultural tendency on the part of these elite men and women sometimes to find something in nature and then to manipulate it in a certain way to make a kind of link between the world of man and the world of nature on the one hand and the sort of macrocosm and microcosmic versions of, of the cosmos. And in some ways, and I'm a little bit partisan here, rocks are where it's at. And, <laughs> um, well, if you look at the objects, uh, first of all, Carol just mentioned that the, all of the, the, the sort of garden view that you would get in a traditional scholar studio outside of, of the, the doors and windows, you would always be viewing some kind of space within the garden that there would be an arrangement of rocks and then plant material, and usually a lot of paving as well. Um, maybe you'd have a water feature that would depend on the scale of the garden. But the rocks that they would pick are not just any rocks. They, they would choose rocks to make artificial mountains or, or boulders in some kind of scenic landscape, but they were not just plain ordinary rocks. You would choose interesting looking rocks, rocks that had strange shapes and lots of holes and lots of texture, because unlike European culture, um, in China, rocks are living. Rocks have chi, they have the vital energy, and in, in not only have they been using rocks to create miniature landscapes in Chinese gardens since at least the 8th century, but there becomes a connoisseurship of rocks. And there are literally people collect rocks for, they, again, finding this thing in nature that is cool and has aesthetic principles that they really appreciate. They, their famous rocks get passed down to people as almost artworks. And you see, again, the rocks in the gardens, this practice becomes miniaturized in the scholar's studio, um, both right now on display, but also in the adjacent case, something called scholar's rocks, that they are interesting rocks that are collected that anywhere from this big, uh, and there's quite a large one on display here, that's, uh, to tiny, tiny rocks that are literally created their own hardwood stands mm -hmm. that they're given pride of place on the desk of the scholar or on the bookcase uh, for, for aesthetic appreciation. So in the connoisseurship of rocks, uh, there are four qualities that people look for, and it, wonderfully they, they rhyme, jo, lo, to, and sho. And people literally would look at sho, uh, refers, means thinness, but it refers to the shape. Uh, jo means wrinkles, it refers to the texture of the rock. Low means moistness, so whether or, or it's sort of this kind of surface quality and often color of the rock. And then to means penetration, so it refers to these holes that we get in all these crazy scholars rocks, or a lot of them that have lots of holes. They love holes because it means that it's a tension between solid and void, and that the more texture and interesting shape and whole solids and voids there are means the more conduits of energy there they are. And this is what was really appreciated. Um, and rocks, as Carol mentioned, the dream stones, these pictorial rocks, it just shows you how, again, rocks become paintings. So that, that relationship between the natural world and the sort of aesthetic artificial manipulation by man you know, there's so many ways that rocks become part of this environment in, in the garden, as sculpture, as paint, as literally as paintings, and then even as functional objects, right? The ink stones where you grind your ink. Um, and I mean, you guys, uh, I always find it interesting that there were paintings of both ink stones and rocks. What mm -hmm. do you think that, that signifies? I, I, they're valued. Again, I think, from my perspective, what's fascinating is that you have known known artists of ink stone, mm -hmm. so to speak. You, you, these are these are commodities that are not simply utilitarian. These are are aesthetic, beautiful objects, kind of like the beautiful women in the garden. But well, we can go down that path right now. But so, again, that the craftsmanship that goes into an ink stone is valued as much as the craftsmanship that goes into a painting. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, a lot of the scholars themselves are making their own ink stones. Mm -hmm. I think one of the ones that's on display right now is yeah, later made, periods, yeah. made by one of the scholars uh, himself. So again, there's, there's that kind of tension as well. Um, and bringing out, finding the stone and mm -hmm. bringing out the, the, quality. The, the, the quality, but 
what in our Western mind would often be considered a flaw is often something that is sort of released mm -hmm. in the working of the stone to be made into a feature that mm -hmm. is sort of a, a, a prized feature of mm -hmm. an ink stone or yeah. uh, again some of these worked stones mm -hmm. that they, they do for the scholars mm -hmm. rock so I think that's a really yeah. fascinating um, different way of looking at the ink stones mm -hmm. well I think one of the things that's important about ink stones is we often, although not always, know the name of the person who made the stone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that that suggests that it, it's not in the realm of pure craft, right. oh. um, yeah. that, that the individual who made it is, um, is important right. and individual right. and, and the name has to be preserved. Right. And just like, I mean, scholars' rocks and ink stones, as well as other kinds of objects, I mean, they really do have a status of, as you said, valued objects. The fact that you have paintings of these indicates that they are prized, just like an antique bronze vessel mm -hmm. by this period of time, and that their makers are honored in that way, too. Mm -hmm. And they become, and, and again, because they have a history as objects, I mean, there are famous ink stones. Right. Um, I mean, and then people actually start to have stories about superhuman properties of rocks and ink stones. And again, this idea of the craftsman, as you said, revealing what we might think of a flaw in the stone mm -hmm. and bringing it out in the design, the carved design of decoration of the ink stone, it's finding that art in nature, finding, and one could say actually finding the life in there, mm -hmm. the personality. They talk about the personality of the rock too. Uh, and it, yeah, well, I was just thinking, taking that back to the Dream of the Red Chamber, mm -hmm. since the stone sort of figures at the very beginning. Um, again, these aren't lifeless stones. This is a stone that inherently has some life within right. it. The question is, how how does it how is it set free? How is it? And how actually, is that chi let out? Yeah.